This program is made possible by the individual members of the Lincoln Academy of Illinois. From the Brayton Auditorium on the campus of Illinois State University at Normal, the Lincoln Academy of Illinois presents the 2003 Convocation and Investiture of Laureates, Profiles in Leadership. A tireless advocate for developmentally and physically challenged children and adults. A corporate leader dedicated to improving schools and community life in Illinois. A citizen legislator who fought for school children, farmers, and fiscal responsibility in the Illinois Senate. A gifted singer whose performances have thrilled opera lovers the world over. A business executive committed to building new partnerships between corporate America and public education. A religious leader who led the struggle for civil rights and better working conditions for the people of Illinois. Since 1965, more than 200 Illinoisans have been honored as laureates of the Lincoln Academy of Illinois an organization dedicated to recognizing those who have brought honor to their state in the spirit of that most famous Illinoisan, Abraham Lincoln. Each laureate represents a lifetime commitment to leadership and service to humanity. The joy of being involved with the Lincoln Academy of Illinois is that it allows us to formally thank the people who have done so much with their lives and to make certain that they stand as a beacon to those who would emulate them and to make certain that the ideals of Lincoln are preserved. The Academy selects people from various areas of endeavor. Uh, we select uh, from the area of business, of uh, science, medicine, the arts and the performing arts, um, the law and government, uh, social service work. Uh, it's to uh, plumb the depth of talent within the state of Illinois in various areas. Uh, and uh, in the past, we have had such luminaries as Ronald Reagan, who was president of the United States, Gwendolyn Brooks, the poet laureate of the state of Illinois, Walter Payton, a famous athlete. So you see, it's a varied, a varied a number of people and a very number of a varied number of endeavors. Patterned upon the learned academies of Europe, the Lincoln Academy of Illinois is unique among the 50 states. Members of the nonpartisan, not-for-profit academy are appointed by the governor, who also serves as its president. Each fall, the Academy meets to select the laureates who are to receive the Order of Lincoln Medallion the following spring. The state's highest award for individual achievement, its colors of red, violet, and green, symbolize the state bird, the cardinal, the state flower, the violet, and the leaves of the state tree, the oak. In addition to its laureates, the Lincoln Academy also recognizes future leaders by honoring the outstanding senior students at each of Illinois' four-year degree-granting institutions in ceremonies held each fall at the Illinois State Capitol. We appreciate that a number of prominent government executives, legislators, and judges are with us this evening. We thank you for attending. And now for the key part of the convocation, our ceremony where we recognize the work of famous Illinoisans citizens by birth or residence. We regret that the president of the Academy, Governor Rod Blagojevich, is unable to attend this convocation. Presiding in his stead is Ms. Luana Peters, Office of the Governor, Deputy Chief of Staff for Social Services. I now ask that Reverend Stanley Davis, a rector of the Academy, read the citation for Laureate Sister Rosemary Connolly, Reverend Davis. Born in Chicago, Sister Rosemary Conley belongs to the Religious Sisters of Mercy and since 1969 has served as Executive Director of Misericordia Heart of Mercy, leading the way to providing a dignified and nurturing environment where mentally disabled children and adults can reach their full potential. Sister Rosemary's vow to serve the poor, sick, and uneducated led her first to teaching in archdiocesan schools and then to advanced studies in sociology and social work. Three years after earning a master's degree in social work from Loyola University, she was appointed administrator of Misericordia Home. At Misericordia, now Misericordia Heart of Mercy, 
Sister Rosemary has brought Christ's love to the care of those with disabilities, improving and enriching the lives of hundreds of persons in her care has been Sister Rosemary's life work. She has risen to the challenges of providing physical care, emotional support, and spiritual nurturing to every resident by becoming an innovative problem solver. When community services didn't exist for Misericordia residents, she saw to it that Misericordia created them. As a result, those who live at Misericordia may experience the joy of friendship, the benefits of meaningful work, and the sublime satisfaction of spiritual growth and healing. Sister Rosemary would be the first to tell you that her work at Misericordia is its own reward. But that hasn't stopped scores of local, state, and national organizations from honoring her dedication to persons with disabilities. She has been granted honorary degrees by four universities, DePaul, Lewis, Loyola, and Notre Dame. She has been honored by a host of organizations, including the Chicago Pediatric Society, the American College of, Sur of Physicians, the Epilepsy Foundation of Greater Chicago, and the Special Olympics Board. Among a host of other honors, she was named the first woman Grand Marshal of Chicago's St. Patrick's Day Parade in 1994. Her Irish parents certainly would have been proud. Sister Rosemary has given her life to Misericordia. She has made it a home and a haven for the disabled. God has blessed her, and he has blessed those in her care through her. Governor Blagojevich, it is my privilege to present to you as a laureate of the Lincoln Academy of Illinois, Sister Rosemary Connell. Thank you very much. In the scripture we are told, there is a time for every happening under the heavens. Tonight is surely a time of celebration. To be a recipient of the Lincoln Academy of Illinois highest award is truly an honor. I thank Governor Blagojevich, all the officers and regents of the Academy for wanting me to be so recognized. Whenever I'm invited to receive an award, I find myself looking to the heavens and smiling, thinking of my parents. When I was 18 years old, I told my Irish immigrant folks I wanted to enter the Sisters of Mercy, a religious group of women dedicated to service, because I wanted to live a quiet, humble, unassuming life. Here I am almost 52 years later receiving this distinguished award. I'm convinced God does have a sense of humor. <laughs> I never personalize award, but I do appreciate receiving them because I believe the Academy is very publicly saying that they believe the misericordia children and adults not only have a right to life, but to one worth living, because that is what Misericordia is all about. No one wants their child, any child, to be born or to become mentally or physically disabled. But Misericordia witnesses to the world the power of the human spirit when that spirit finds its source in the Lord. For Misericordia's children and adults, are some of the happiest people you would ever have the privilege of meeting. I do believe their secret is that they accept life on God's terms and stand in contradiction to the false value system so prevalent in our society today. They are gifted people if the environment is open to their gifts and they surely can show us the way to God. I also want to acknowledge the commitment and dedication of almost a thousand staff people who share life with our children and adults of Misericordia. They know 
that our children and adults will never be the so-called successes of the world, but if each day is worth living and one of compassion and love, then they feel their work is important and valued. I want to honor the parents and families of the children and adults, many who have been subjected to some people's attitude that their child is a costly mistake that could or should have been avoided. You are recognizing their courage and the unconditional love that they shower upon their most vulnerable member of their family. This most distinguished award is also received in the name of thousands of volunteers who comprise the Misericordia family. They share our mission with them. They know that it's no longer adequate if you are a believer just to have a personal acceptance of God in your lives. If you are a believer, you are called to embrace the social dimension of the gospel that means that you must, must reach out to God's wounded people. As believers, we know in 2003, the only way God's presence will be known, God's voice will be heard, God's work will be done, is through our voices, our work, our presence. We are believers, and the Lord has promised us two things. He told us that this life will have meaning, and we will live forever. As someone said, if you get a better offer, you should go for it. God bless you all, and thank you. Thank you, Laureate Sister Conley. I now ask that Mr. Ernest Wish, a regent of the Academy, read this citation for Laureate Ronald J. Gidwitz. Mr. Wish. Ron Gidwitz has dedicated himself to helping people in need, particularly children. He has always been at the forefront in philanthropy and education. Ron was appointed to chair the Economic Development Commission by the late Chicago Mayor Harold Washington. He was reappointed to that post by Mayor Gene Sawyer. Ron served three terms as chairman of Chicago City Colleges at the request of Mayor Richard Daley. And Governor Jim Thompson asked Ron to serve as chair of the Blue Ribbon Task Force on Human Resource Development. In 1994, Ron Gidwitz founded the Illinois Business Education Coalition which resulted in the passage of the 1995 Chicago School Reform. Governor George Ryan named Ron chairman of the Illinois State Board of Education, and Ron has served on the board of Boys and Girls Club of America for over 25 years, holding various positions, including vice chair and national secretary. As chairman of the Government Relations Committee, Ron was instrumental in securing increased annual funding from four to $142 million. These funds are used to help three and a half million disadvantaged youngsters. Ron served as president and CEO of Helene Curtis for 17 years, leading that company to the forefront of Chicago industry before it was sold in 1996. He also serves on numerous public company boards of directors. In civic matters, Ron has served as a trustee of Rush Presbyterian St. Luke's Medical Center, the Field Museum of National History, and the Lyric Opera of Chicago. Ron has brought his business acumen to education in Illinois by promoting private partnerships, increasing accountability of school boards, stressing effective teacher training, and sharply increasing federal dollars for Illinois education. Ron Gidwitz stands for all the things that Abraham Lincoln admired. Ron Gidwitz stands for all of the things that make a state and a nation strong. He is the embodiment of volunteerism, leadership, and education. Governor Bologoevich, it is my privilege to present to you, as a laureate of the Lincoln Academy of Illinois, Ronald J. Gidwitz. I've had a blessed life to have had strong parents, good schools, and many, many opportunities. 
The older I get, the more I come to appreciate that. Because over the years, I've had the opportunity to observe the inequities that others face. And I'm still, regretfully, seeing inequities. I see, for example, two types of schools. Those in wealthy areas that are filled with modern libraries, terrific science labs, and a plethora of honors classes. And then there's the others in the poorer neighborhoods, schools that lack for those things which enrich education and enrich children. In some cases, they even lack the essentials such as up-to-date textbooks, even here in our state. When you think about it, you frequently hear the claim, children are the future, and these children in our schools are the future of Illinois, and they aren't being given the tools by which to have that future. That inequity has become a quest for me, a quest to give all children, no matter where they live or how much money their families have, it's a quest to give them an equal and high quality education. President Lincoln was assailed in the press as he led the nation away from slavery. The attacks didn't stop him. There were no polls telling him what was the right or wrong thing to do. Abraham Lincoln saw his true north and he headed for it. He saw a wrong and he righted it. He saw the proposition that all men and women are created equal and he took steps to bring about that equality. In Illinois, my role as chairman of the Board of Education, we've been working for that very same equality as well. We've been arguing that an equal education is a right of all Illinois' children, all of them, no matter where they live. We've been arguing that schools must be funded sufficiently by the state. They should not be reliant primarily on real estate property taxes. Today's schools in Illinois are faced with a crisis. They're cutting classes, they're cutting advanced placement classes, but they're also cutting regular classes. They're eliminating art, they're eliminating music in many schools, after school activities, foreign languages. We're increasing class sizes, we're, closing, we're shortening the school day, we're shortening the school year, and it's all due to lack of funding. This should not be. Illinois must put their children first before any other budget considerations. It should be, it must be, students first. This is a goal each one of us in this room should be striving to reach. It's a goal, it's just a goal. It's one of the goals which Abraham Lincoln held dear. To quote him, upon the subject of education, not presuming to dedicate any plan or system respecting it, I can only say that I view it as the most important subject which we as a people can be engaged in. President Lincoln made that statement in his first political announcement, March 9, 1832. We, in his home state, will, would do well to follow his lead and put students first. They are, after all, the future of the land of Lincoln. With gratitude, I accept this honor as a Lincoln Laureate. Thank you very much. Thank you, Laureate Gidwitz. I ask that Mr. Ronald Warfield, a general trustee of the Academy, read the citation for Laureate John W. Maitland, Jr., Mr. Warfield. Born in Normal, Illinois, John W. Maitland once described himself as first and foremost a farmer, a farmer who loved the land. That love for the land inspired him during his 24 years of service in the Illinois Senate and to advocate causes and sponsor legislation related to the state's food and agricultural industry. But he also became known as the Senate's Mr. Education for his leadership in reforming the state schools and by the time of his retirement in 2002, his years of service had won him the title Dean of the Senate. Senator Maitland's agricultural roots run deep. 
A, de a definitive list of his agricultural legislation that Senator Maitland has sponsored and causes that he has championed would be well beyond the scope of this citation. But let me cite a couple. He worked for increased funding for food and agriculture and conservation research and establishing the Council on Food and Agricultural Research and the Food Research Fund. His vision of high-tech agriculture resulted in the creation of a statewide biotechnology council and important advances in university-level life science research. In recognition of his contributions, the Illinois Biotechnology Industry Organization established a John W. Maitland, Jr. Biotechnology Leadership Award. As a champion of education, Senator Maitland made himself an expert on school finance leading the fight to develop an equitable and adequate funding system in public education in Illinois. He also served as chairman of the State Board of Education's Mandate Task Force, vice chairman of the Task Force on School Finance, and many other statewide task force on education. First as a member and then in 1993 as chairman of the Senate Appropriations Committee and Republican Assistant Majority Leader, he played a critical role in shaping the state's budget in the late 1980s and early 1990s. He's also been an active uh, contributor to his local community and, and has received numerous uh, accolades for his honors and for his leadership in agriculture and education by most statewide organization in those areas. But the overriding characteristic that sets Senator Maitland apart from the others that are in public service is the high esteem in which he is held not only by his friends or his party or his people of his interest group, but by his colleagues of the opposite party or opposite philosophical direction. Senator Maitland earned a reputation second to none for his trustworthiness and his integrity. He possesses a sense of obligation to the people that every lawmaker, past, present, and future, will be measured against. Senator Maitland became known as a statesman. More than a leader, he's a leader's leader. In a time when we yearn for integrity and honor among our public leaders, John Maitland demonstrated such character during his tenure as senator. For these characteristics and for his many years of devoted public service, we honor him tonight with the Order of Lincoln. Governor Bogoyevich, it is my privilege to present to you as a laureate of the Lincoln Academy of Illinois, Senator John W. Maitland. As Abraham Lincoln stood tall, tonight John Maitland stands tall. He is deeply honored and filled with great pride and emotion to become a Lincoln Academy laureate. John has always held in high esteem the privilege of serving in the state legislator, legislature as a senator. Serving as a senator, he never felt he was doing more than was expected of him. Like Lincoln, John was born and raised on a farm. However, John loved the farm. Lincoln said, quote, my father taught me to work hard on the farm, but he never taught me to like it. <laughs> John's roots are still in the soil of Illinois. Several years ago, when approached to consider seeking a seat in Congress, John was not interested for several reasons. And he told his brother, I do not want to leave my family, the Senate, or Illinois. John still has his hands in the soil, and as he wears his medallion, it is with great pride for the nature it represents of Illinois the cardinal, the violet, and the leaves of the oak tree. Knowing John's admiration of Lincoln, I think he lived by Lincoln's words. Quote, the leading role for the lawyer, as for the man of every other calling, is diligence, leaving nothing for tomorrow which can be done today. Never let your correspondence fall behind. Whatever piece of business you have in hand, before stopping, do all the labor pertaining to it, which can then be done. I know John would have many more uh, words to say to you tonight, but I always say I, I'm the short speaker in the house. <laughs> so to the Lincoln Academy, 
John and Maitland thanks you, and so does all his family. Thank you. I ask that Gail Pyatt, a regent of the Academy, read the citation for Laureate Cheryl Mills. Mills, excuse me, Mrs. Pyatt. Born in Downers Grove, Illinois, Cheryl Mills is the leading baritone of his generation. His operatic performances have earned him international fame, countless devoted fans, three Grammy Awards, and the distinction of being the most recorded American opera singer. A musical prodigy by any standard, Mr. Milnes studied voice and mastered several instruments. At college, he entered a pre-medicine program, but soon he returned to music as a student at Drake University. I'm sure his audiences are very glad he did. What he has called the luckiest possible beginning for his career came at age 25 when he won an audition with the Boris Godolsky Opera Company. With that company, he toured the United States, singing a dozen roles in more than 300 performances. Soon he was performing to great acclaim at the New York City Opera and the Metropolitan Opera. His performance as Miller in Verdi's Louisa Miller was literally a showstopper at the Met and earned him renown as the dominant baritone of our time. Then he went on to the great opera capitals of the world, Vienna, Berlin, Munich, London, Paris, and Moscow and he has delighted audiences now for four decades, performing classic roles seemingly custom made for his brilliant baritone. He has played some of the best known characters in opera and has won special acclaim for his performances in Verdi operas, notably Macbeth, La Traviata, and Aida. Mr. Milnes continues to perform before audiences in operatic roles as a concert soloist and as a conductor. He teaches master classes in voice here and abroad. He is noted for his generous encouragement of young singers in his new role as the John Evans Distinguished Professor of Music at Northwestern University. Mr. Milnes once told a reporter that singers on stage open their souls to an audience. It is that intimacy with the audience that has earned him a loyal following and approving critics. In addition to seven honorary degrees, he has won recognition from the governments of Italy and France for his contributions to the arts. For his universally acclaimed contribution to opera, voice, and the enjoyment of countless audiences, we are pleased tonight to add the Order of Lincoln to his honors. <coughs> Governor Blagojevich, it is my privilege to present to you, as a laureate of the Lincoln Academy of Illinois, Mr. Cheryl Mills. Thank you all very much. Um, sometimes we performers, in my case singers, hear the accomplishments of my uh, August colleagues here and we're, we're a bit humbled, or even more than a bit humbled, uh, by the, the, the unbelievable tasks and deeds that they have done. However, I guess we have to deal with uh, and use what we have in its best possible way. I'm very thrilled and, as I said, humbled to accept this award. Some time ago for RCA, I made three sacred recordings in uh, my hometown church, the First Congregational Church of Downers Grove. And I dedicated each of those to a different uh, person, a different source, because the third's not a person. The first was my grandfather, Charles K. Rowe, uh, 
churchman, lay preacher, lay singer. He was a volunteer road commissioner for the Downers Grove Township in the 20s and 30s. Uh, obviously passed his passion for music along to my mother, who was, the, the second record was dedicated to her. She was a pianist, piano teacher, church choir director, and I was brought up in the music of the First Congregational Church, all the, the great hymns, of course, but all the great oratorios that we all know so well and love. Her inspiration and, uh, at the appropriate time, nudging for practice uh, is, I suppose, a, a great part of the reason why I'm here. The third record I dedicated to hometowns specifically Downers Grove. John Shoemaker's father was the band director there for 40 years, are we talking about? 36, 40 is close enough. And uh, what Ron said before, uh, curriculums are being curtailed, and that's sad, especially in the, in the arts area. Uh, you had mentioned you were lucky. I was lucky. John and a host of, well, more than a host, hundreds and hundreds of aspiring musicians in Downers Grove. We had a grade school band, a grade school orchestra. In high school, I had band, orchestra, and a cappella choir every day. All three, every day. All of that, accumulatively. Obviously, one of the reasons that I have been able to do what I have done in my life. Uh, Downers Grove has always been a very musical city and still is, even with certain uh, cutbacks that have been national, maybe even international in scope. Um, I have always felt and never, never uh, hesitated to give praise to either people that I studied with in the past or influences as a hometown. So on behalf of my grandfather, my mother, and father, of course, and on behalf of Downers Grove, I accept this honor with huge pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Laureate Milne. I ask that President Victor Braschini, an academic trustee of the Academy, read the citation for Laureate Edward B. Rust, Jr., President Braschini. Born in Chicago, Edward B. Rust, Jr. is the chairman and chief executive officer of the world's largest provider of property and casualty insurance, State Farm, and an earnest advocate of quality education at every level. Despite his many successes, however, he has been described as modest, low-key, and unassuming, an individual worthy of great personal respect. And I can just tell you from my personal experience with him, in my job, I meet a lot of famous and important people but more than that, I meet a lot of people who think they are famous and important. <laughs> and I can say that Mr. Russ is a true exception to that role. He's one of those very rare men or women of greatness who seeks absolutely no recognition for the things he does, but is infinitely deserving of every accolade that finds him. And I know on behalf of a lot of people in Bloomington Normal, we're just thrilled that this particular accolade has found him tonight. Mr. Russ spent most of his working life with the State Farm Insurance Company, starting as a management trainee, then moving up to the company attorney and vice president before becoming president and chief executive officer of the company in 1985, and then chairman of the board in 1987. Describing his business philosophy, he once said that our policyholders measure us not by our size, but by the personal quality one-on-one -on -one service we provide. Mr. Rust also serves on several other boards of directors and has been active in the state and national business communities by chairing such organizations as the Financial Services Roundtable, the Illinois Business Roundtable, and the American Enterprise Institute. Believing that many schools are not adequately pre preparing our children to meet the demands of higher education and the workplace, Mr. Rust has made himself a bridge between the worlds of business and education. His publicly supported educational reform, speaking out in favor of higher standards, quality teaching, testing, and assistance for low-performing students. 
He co-chaired the Business Coalition for Excellence in Education and served on President George W. Bush's Transition Advisory Team for Education. He also chairs the Business Higher Education Forum and co-chairs the Committee for Economic Development Subcommittee on Education Studies. He is a former chairman of the Business Roundtable's Education Initiative, serves as a director of Achieve Incorporated and the National Center for Educational Accountability, and was a member of the National Commission on Mathematics and Science Teaching for the 21st Century. Under Mr. Rust, State Farm has contributed to numerous educational institutions and initiatives, including my favorite one, Illinois State University, my second favorite one, Illinois Wesleyan University, and the Beyond the Books Foundation, which offers grants to local elementary school and secondary school teachers for innovative educational proposals. The impact of his work will be felt for many, many years to come. Ladies and gentlemen of Illinois, it is my privilege to present to you as a laureate of the Lincoln Academy of Illinois, Mr. Edward B. Rust, Jr. It is with a blend of great pride and a sense of humility that I stand here this evening to be on this stage with the others being inducted tonight and to contemplate my name being added to the roster of other Academy members is simply quite humbling. It gives me pause to, frankly, wonder whether or not I should even be here. But who wouldn't be proud of the association with these people and this fine Academy? I am indeed deeply honored. But the truth is that much of what I receive credit for is the product of the diligent work of many other dedicated people within the State Farm organization and the business and education organizations that I've had an opportunity to lead. It's largely their energy, their commitment, their passion for academic achievement of all children that brings me to this stage this evening. We've reached a challenging yet opportunity-filled moment here in the history of American education. We have a choice to make. We can give the new No Child Left Behind legislation our full support, or we can take the easy route and back away from demanding accountability, better teaching, and continuous improvement. We can aim for a bullseye or we can shoot the arrow first and paint a target around it. I believe we have this excellent window of opportunity to tap the public resolve that exists at this very moment to improve public education. We should not underestimate that what tomorrow's world will bring demands greater achievement of our children. And we must not underestimate what our children want to achieve because those of us who have been in the classroom, those of you who are in the classroom day in and day out, understand what that level of excitement that occurs in a young child's mind when they understand what it is you're talking about, when that light, that switch is turned on. There's probably nothing more powerful and rewarding than those who are involved in the classroom and watching those lights come on. I want to thank my wife and best friend for the last 28 years, herself a former teacher. Sally provides me with a great deal of inspiration, counsel, and levity, and for that I will always be most deeply appreciative. I also want to thank the Academy for this great honor that you've bestowed on me tonight. You know, I think sitting here with John Maitland is indeed another honor. Most don't realize that uh, to the degree it was John that got me interested in education. It got me some of the discussions that uh, he would take my phone call and we'd talk about a few things. But that was a spark. It got me interested. And for that, I will also be forever grateful. Again, it is indeed an honor to be here tonight and to be included on the list of laureates. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.
I ask that Mr. Warren Daniels, a general trustee of the Academy, read the citation for Laureate Reverend Addie L. Wyatt. Mr. Daniels. Born in Brookhaven, Mississippi, and a Chicago resident since the age of six, Reverend Dr. Addie L. Wyatt is a longtime social activist and lifetime person of God who, as a labor leader, proponent of equal rights, and pastor, has been a, a passionate voice for the rights of the disenfranchised, dispassionate, and the downtrodden. Young Addie grew up in the church, nurtured by a community of faith that sustained her through the death of her beloved mother, the raising of several younger siblings when she herself was a new wife and mother, and the challenges of being a black woman with reform-minded beliefs. Just 17 when she began working in a Chicago packing plant, her first-hand encounters with gender and race discrimination prompted her to speak up for the rights of all workers, and she did it with considerable success. She was the first woman elected president of a local union of the United Packing House Workers. For 30 years, she served in various union leadership positions, and during that time served on advisory commissions for Presidents Kennedy, Johnson, and Carter. She was the first woman to be named as vice president of the half million member amalgamated meat cutters and butcher workmen of North America. At the time of her retirement from union work, she was international vice president of the United Food and Commercial Workers Union. However, labor issues were not her only concerns. Her belief in human dignity and rights for all arise from her belief that all are equal in the eyes of God. A spiritual advisor to Dr. Martin Luther King, she joined him and many others, including her husband, in landmark civil rights marches in Selma, Alabama, Chicago, and Washington, D.C. She was a founding member of Operation Breadbasket and Operation Push. Ordained in 1960, Reverend Wyatt, with her husband, Dr. Charles S. Wyatt, together founded the Vernon Park Church of God on Chicago's South Side, where they co-pastored for 45 years. The couple's work there has addressed the community's needs for assistance for the young, for the elderly, and for the homeless. A community center adjacent to the church was aptly named the Wyatt Community Center and Family Life Center when it opened in 1999. Though retired from active ministry, she continues to focus on the welfare of others as president and CEO of the Wyatt Center. There's so much more to tell. Reverend Wyatt was recognized as one of the nation's most influential women by Time Magazine when it declared 1975 the year of women. For years, she was listed as one of Ebony's 100 most influential black Americans. The accolades go on and on. Every award, every honor, every distinction attests to her great faith, her great courage, and great strength. Governor Blagojevich, it is my honor and privilege to present to you as laureate of the Lincoln Academy of Illinois, Reverend Dr. Addie L. Wyatt. I'm deeply honored to be recognized by the Lincoln Academy for my life and work as a trade unionist, as an advocate for civil rights, for women's rights, and for peace, and a lifetime member of the faith community. I have come by many roads to stand here today to receive this honor. My family moved to Illinois when I was only six years old. In 1930, during the Great Depression, and like other Americans, we suffered many hardships trials and challenges. But we learn that by sticking together and loving one another and trusting in God, we could weather the storms of life 
and light candles rather than curse the darkness. I never thought that this little girl back then would be standing here today, but I believe that God knew because I couldn't have made it without him, and I am grateful but I stand here today to ask you for your prayers and your support for the causes that we have fought for and embraced over the last 50 years or more. Equality, injustice for all Americans, and peace in the world. I want to just thank you for this honor, and I want to invite you to join me in prayer for our world, for our nation, for our families, and especially for our children. Let us reach out and give them a hug. Let us reach out and give them love. They need it and they deserve it. My life has been and will continue to be dedicated to this effort. I come today hopping, but not stopping. And I ask you to continue doing what is necessary that we can help make this nation of ours and yes, this state, this great state of ours, a state and a nation that God will be pleased and can say to all of us, well done. Again, I want to thank you. I love you for being here, and I love you for giving me this opportunity. God bless you. Thank you, Laureate Reverend Wyatt. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor to present Ms. Luanna Peters. First, I must say that I am indeed honored to be representing Governor Rod Blagojevich to this evening. And Chancellor, I'm also humbled by the legacy that is represented in the Academy. America is a nation founded on the principles of freedom and equality. And each successive generation has had to struggle to define and live up to those ideals. Although the Civil War cost hundreds of thousands of lives, Abraham Lincoln knew that there would be no democracy without freedom for all. He once said, those who deny freedom for others deserve it not for themselves and under a just God cannot long retain it. Lincoln was America's greatest champion of freedom. Some say men and women are, grain, are like grains of sand in an ocean who are tossed up and the storms of history and find themselves at the very top of a cresting wave. This could never be said of Lincoln. He was a man who changed the course of history because he chose to. Each day of his life, he made a conscious decision to, be, to lead by personal example and to honor the values laid out in the Declaration of Independence. It is his deeply personal commitment to freedom that allows his words and actions as a political figure to continue resonating today. Lincoln expanded the reach of, American, of the American dream by granting freedom to all Americans. Through his ability to inspire service before self, he established the benchmark for every American leader since. The recipients of the Order of Lincoln are people 
the citizens of Illinois cherish for the knowledge and passion they share with their communities and the expertise that they've given the state and the nation. The advantages of liberty are best attained by education and the continuation of the democratic republic requires an educated republic. Abraham Lincoln understood this better than anyone. In his first political announcement, he said, upon the subject of education, I can only say that I view it as the most important subject which we as a people can be engaged in. This year's six laureates all possess a shared reverence for education and have each furthered its goals. Sister Rosemary Conley, Executive Director of Chicago's Misery Accordi Heart and Mercy Center, has almost single-handedly given hope to and meaning to people with disabilities in Illinois. Her approach to care has shown the benefits of recognizing the needs of all people to grow and learn throughout their lives. And nowhere have I learned more to understand what Sister Connolly does than in the last couple of months as Deputy Chief of Staff for Social Services for Governor Bogorovich. Ron Gidwich is Chairman of Illinois Board of Education. Tough job in times when our resources are very limited. And we're really grateful and pleased to have a gentleman who has made a life history out of taking tough tasks and making them successful. We have a, we're depending on you a great deal. John Maitland, former senator, has been a chief spokesman as for the interests of Illinois, agricultural interests, and for education in this great state. Job well done, sir. We appreciate you. Cheryl Milnes, the world's foremost operatic baritone, is a professor of voice at Northwestern University. He's also developed and inspired other performers worldwide through master classes. Edward B. Rust, Jr., Chairman of the Board and CEO of State Farm Insurance. Among other, many other contributions to education, he served as President George W. Bush on, on President George W. Bush's Transition Advisory Team Committee on Education. And the Reverend Dr. Addie L. Wyatt, the ever advocate for working women and civil rights leaders, and a civil rights leader. She's dedicated her life to the dream of a free, just, and equal America. We appreciate her. At this convocation of the Lincoln Academy of Illinois, we pay tribute and express our direct gratitude to these six exceptional members of the community who personally expanded opportunity for thousands of Illinoisans and Americans. You are each uniquely, de uniquely deserving of this award, Illinois' greatest honor, and together you embody our community's highest aspirations. You are evident of the replenishment of the ideals of Abraham Lincoln in this generation. And through you, future generations will experience Lincoln's legacy firsthand. Again, I am privileged to represent Governor Rod Bogoyevich in presenting the Order of Lincoln to the to the 2003 laureates. Congratulations on your well-deserved honors. 